I think we will hear a diversity of perspectives on public, private, people, partnerships. And uh, I'd like each of the panelists, and I will introduce you as, as we, as we uh, go through the discussion, um, I would, I've asked them to provide their specific experience. And maybe from this diversity, we can draw some commonalities and, and have an interesting discussion. Um, just to frame that discussion, I want to pick up on, on one line that, that I had in my opening address yesterday. Um, the PPP, public-private people, has become uh, a very much used concept. And, and I, I suggested that maybe we should be more direct and say what it is all actually about. And then we could perhaps, instead of public-private people, we could talk about politics, profits, and participation. And, and uh, in, in that sense, think about how could these three Ps benefit from collaboration. And obviously, politics will benefit if progress is made to wider development goals. That will help politics and politicians. Profits will probably be made if, if uh, access by stakeholders to capital and markets are becoming fairer, more affordable, and more long-term. Um, participation will probably be widespread if human rights and uh, tenure systems, for example, are respected, enforced, and trusted. And how can we achieve that? So there are a lot of things at stake here and, and many different perspectives to bring into the, into the uh, uh, ventures that we will hear more about. So I'd, I'd like to, to, without further ado, turn to to, this, to, to, to the panel. And, and first, I would like to ask Pak Putera Partama, who is the Director General of Sustainable Production Forest Management within the Indonesian Ministry of Environment and Forests. Um, can you please give us your perspective on, on the, these partnerships? Thank you, Peter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, audience. Um, in our case in Indonesia, the public and private partnership is uh, like automatic. Uh, and re in recent days, uh, we are adding uh, the third P, uh, the, the people, to the partnership. Uh, why is it so? Because in, in Indonesia, 99% of the forest land is owned by the states, and it is stipulated in our uh, basic constitution that it must be utilized for the highest welfare of the people and in doing so also by regulation who we invite uh, private uh, we invite private sector to do uh, the business and so in a sense it's it's it is a form of uh, public and private uh, partnership in this case the government uh, would set the regulation uh, the norm, the standards, the guidelines, and the criteria, and the private sector will undertake the management. Uh, recently, uh, we are improving this partnership uh, through uh, the development of what, what we name as a forest management unit. So the, the entire forest uh, of Indonesia is now uh, divided into hundreds of forest management units. This forest management unit will really represent the government in the management of forest. So we are shifting from a previous approach in which the partnership was uh, between the government who uh, provide the license and the private who do the business. Now with this uh, forest management unit approach, the government will really, really uh, together with the private sector to undertake the management. And so we are embarking to this new approach from simply in the past just uh, issuing permits, now doing the management together. Uh, we are also, like I said, uh, extending the, the access of the people to the forest resource, so the third P. And this is especially in the utilization of the forest land for the production of food, and fuel, and also the utilization of forest service. So, um, 
this uh, going to be a form of optimization of the utilization of uh, forest lands. And as, at the same time, uh, we perceive it's a, it's a good approach to, uh, to solve the uh, conflict, uh, tenure conflict with, with the people. And by uh, giving the people more address in the utilization of forest land. So in short, uh, the PPPP is not a new approach to us in Indonesia, but we are still improving it uh, to, to increase the effectiveness toward the uh, uh, achievement of sustainable forest management and increasing the welfare of the people. And we are convinced uh, to answer the question uh, raised by uh, Chairman before, that we are convinced that this is the approach that we are going to uh, take uh, and we believe going to be a good solution to our uh, problem. Uh, thanks, Pak. Um, just to follow up immediately on, on, on your presentation, I, I, was, I was struck by using, you used the word automatic. And, and uh, that's, uh, it can be automatic in different ways, I suppose, but, but in, in this, even if it has been automatic for a long time, you also describe that it has evolved and, and that you're now much more um, uh, direct about this uh, partnership. So, mm -hmm. um, in, in, uh, in, if you look at cars, the automatic gearboxes have developed from very inefficient models a long time ago to now you have seven gears and uh, much higher fuel efficiency. Can you draw a parallel here? Is, how much more automatic is it today, and how much more accepted is it today compared to earlier? Uh, if we compare to the car, as you take it, um, I think it's uh, uh, going the, the, uh, the other way. In terms of car, you, you mentioned that we move from less effective to more effective, right? Uh, from the uh, no, uh, from the non-automatic to automatic, but in this case, in in our case, in the partnership, in the past, uh, it's 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 automatic in terms that uh, the, by regulation, by uh, constitution, uh, we are uh, we must by definition by definition we must uh, cooperate with the private sector, uh, but only in terms of the government. For, uh, for, issuing the license and the private sector doing the business. Now, uh, it's not that simple uh, anymore, so because we are, uh, the government will really uh, get involved in the, in the management through the management, uh, forest management unit I mentioned. And um, also the people, uh, both uh, individuals or in uh, cooperative or in groups will be uh, really involved in the practice of the management. So it's not getting uh, more simple, simpler actually, but uh, we believe that that will be a better way uh, in order to achieve our uh, goal, ultimate goal. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. So let me then turn to Brian Williams uh, sitting in the next chair. Um, Brian is the regional director of Asia, for Asia for the Wildlife Works Carbon. And uh, this will now be a different perspective, and uh, we look forward to hear what you have to say. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Peter, um, for attending. And um, I just wanted to first start off uh, explaining a little bit about our company. Um, so uh, Wildlife Works Carbon is a Red Plus developer. And we are one of the leading, the world's leading Red Plus developing, development companies. Um, we started our activities in Africa, and we were the first company to have a VCS Red Plus methodology uh, be verified and utilize that methodology in Kenya and uh, produce the first Red Plus credits through VCS. Um, and uh, we have sold. Um, the most Red Plus credits through the VCS mechanism to this point. Um, and so uh, from our perspective in this, um, uh, in the politics, profit and participation, we're, we're, we come from the opposite end. So we started with participation. Uh, our company was working for 10 years 
in the bush in Kenya. Um, we do not have an office in Nairobi. Our, our office is in the bush. Um, and we started out originally as a company that produced uh, t-shirts. We created an eco-factory. And the idea behind Wildlife Works was to, um, in order to protect wildlife, um, our concept was that you had to put the local people to work. And, um, and if they had an alternative livelihood, the local people would then go ahead and protect their resources. Um, and um, with, that, with the idea of Red Plus, uh, uh, we thought, well, this might be a, a very useful finance mechanism to make that happen, to make this happen, and to scale it throughout the world. Um, so we started with the people, um, working with the people, and um, today our, we, our original project was 30,000 hectares in um, between Savo East and Savo West National Parks in Kenya. And today it is up to 120,000 hectares, and uh, we have uh, approximately 250 staff, and of those staff there are only eight that are foreigners and everyone else is local. Uh, we support schools, we've supported um, a medical facility in the, in the town close by, um, and these are all through the, um, not profits, um, we, are, we still have not made profit off of that project to date. Um, we've poured all that back in to operate the project, and so um, we support those people. Uh, we now have, instead of just one factory, we have three factories now in the region, so we have 150 um, people that are employed in those factories. Um, and then we also help build schools and create water catchments. Um, and in terms of working with the people, um, one of the reasons that I have not mentioned the, the political or working with the public at this point is all of this land where we did the first project is actually uh, community owned land. And so the ranches in the region, there's 35 ranches that we signed up to do our Red Plus project, and they're all owned by the local villagers. Um, some of the ranches have up to 1,000 shareholders in the ranch. Um, and so uh, the way that we structured the project was that the local landowners, um, the, all the community members, got a share in, in, this, in our sales. And then on top of that, um, the, there's a broader community that was utilizing the landscape. And so we created a trust fund that then uh, gave funding to those local communities. And in that sense, um, the local communities decided what to do with that money. And 80% uh, of the funds went to bursaries from kindergarten up to university. So it went to education. So we support education as well. Um, and then the next thing that we did was, we, well, since we were in that region for so long and we had a connection with that region, we wanted to see if our model would work in a different place, and so we developed a project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is where the politics comes into play. So we developed a, it was a former logging concession, and we expanded our methodology, and then um, again, under VCS, we developed a project in that area. In this case, we were partnering with both the local communities, um, a local chief was, is one of our team members there, and the government, because the government owned that um, concession. And at this point, um, we worked with the government to create um, a emissions reductions or subnational jurisdictional program under the FCPF. And that program was just recently approved by the, the methodological, um, the, I mean, the, the technical committee and the carbon fund um, within the FCPF. And now we're going into negotiations for the IRPA. So we've done, uh, we started out with the people. Um, we still haven't gotten there with the, with the profits. And now we're working uh, in, in coordinating with uh, the public and the, and the, and the government uh, in that area. And so we've, we started at the bottom and, and, um, and moved up in, in our... Uh, in our work. Great, thanks, Brian. And, and uh, I like this turning um, turning the order, and, and perhaps if, if you have participation, and then eventually profits, politics will follow. And in fact, it may have to follow because that's that's uh, what, uh, what what will be the the um, the demand and, and the interest. Um, I wanted to pick up one question here, and um, you say that the middle P, the profit P, is not quite there yet. And we all know the, the struggles with, with the uh, um, uh, emissions reductions uh, credits, etc. Um, we all hope it will work. Um, but my question will be, do you see your uh, activities to expand into 
other revenue uh, streams that would not be directly related to the emissions reductions, maybe maybe to develop value chains based on, on those community forests, for example? Um, at this point, um, in the, both of the sites that we're working on, uh, we have not um, being, uh, we're, as a company, we're very focused on protection and protecting extremely threatened landscapes. So at this point, we have not looked into moving up the value chain. And um, if we do look into alternative livelihoods, we look into local things that we might be able to do, whether it's ecotourism, um, whether it's the factory that we created. Um, and so it's, it's very site specific. So um, we, we are looking into agroforestry, however, in DRC with cacao um, and potentially rubber as well in, in, in there. So. Um, uh, those are some things that we look at in each. And now, at the broader scale, we, we definitely look at that as, as we're supporting the development. As we wrote the ERPD for the FCPF, we had to look at the, the landscape that we're, our project is in. So our project is about 220,000 hectares in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the uh, jurisdiction, the Mayandambe uh, province, is 12 million hectares. Um, so I think somebody mentioned yesterday that three million hectares is about the size of Vietnam. So we're working in a province that's four times the size of Vietnam. And that's just one province in the DRC. So we have to now figure out in how to, um, w through all the, the participation of, of these three different, you know, the politics, um, profit and participation, and we have to look at that and, and, and look at the whole landscape and how do we make that happen. And that's a very difficult um, uh, task. That's our next task. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, next, I would like to turn to Pakdarsono Hartono, who is the CEO of PT Rimba. And uh, I believe we will now have a third uh, different perspective on the PPP um, benefits. Please. Um, I, I just want to follow up um, the point that Pak Putra mentioned. I think it, in Indonesia, you know, it's very clear the regulation as, uh, you know, government is the one who give the concession because they own the land to a company. And I think, you know, we, uh, the land is uh, utilized for the goods of the people. That's very clear from our constitution. That's what's being said. But I think uh, from, you know, I want to just share my experience in terms of what I truly think that this PPP can work. Uh, so, for example, you know, just I know some of you probably listened to me yesterday. We are protecting about 150,000 hectares of peatland in central Kalimantan. So we have done a participatory mapping exercise, you know, five years ago, and we have created a bound. Basically, we have a boundary that is agreed among communities, villagers, and the companies, uh, you know, which is in the peripheral of where our concessions are. But this area is still considered to be state-owned land because all lands are state-owned. So the participation or the people side, what we can work is we can actually start, uh, you know, looking into what are the activities that they can do in this area. And then we will actually give a certainty or tenure rights to the people. So what we'll do is, as a company, what we're going to look for for the next few years is to actually uh, encourage and even you know, help these communities to get either a community forestry license, you know, some kind of uh, that, uh, that needs help to Paputra. So I think our, our, where usually, typically, in Indonesia, a private sector will only look at their own concession and their own concession only work on their concession, but we believe that we have to work outside our concession because our business, like I mentioned yesterday, is in conservation. So you know, in order for us to conserve this area, we have to work with the people even outside our conservation area because they can be the agent of deforestation to begin with. So by doing that, you know, basically we can uh, work together with the communities. We propose to Paputra in terms of these are the area that we want it to be a community forest land, a community land that they can, they manage themselves. So in a way, we also help them in terms of putting the governance system. You know, so the PPP, what I mentioned, the new PPP that is coming, is actually having private sector engage more with the participation. Whereas before, a lot of companies are not looking because they, they are strictly bounded by the, the concession rights from the government and them. Um, and the, by the government to, to the private sector. So I also want to mention that uh, while we started uh, seven years ago in the conservation business, now we are looking into the production side of it. So while Brian mentioned all these things that, uh, that he's trying to do, we actually have identified all this potential production in the what we call the buffer area for communities. 
and then you know we will there comes maybe some body basically rice cultivation fisheries even some coconut sugar potential in our area there is a potential of employing up to 24,000 people so my company will look into this as a stream of income possibly we will be an honest broker because at the end we want this profit channel to community as much as possible but this can be a, 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 a an income generation for us as well but it's not going to be meaningful because the idea is we want to capture we want to have a business plan that for the conservation side you know, we, and we want to pass the production side to communities because they are the one who is, who are protecting this area. So um, these are the things that evolve over time. When I said seven years ago, we, well, business plan is always about conservation, but now we are looking into the production. You know, basically we we apply the protection production side, and slowly, and we we can only do that as we understand more and more the potential in that area where the communities have rights, and how to work together with communities, while and when we get trust from communities. So that's how, how things are. So we started from, I mean, the company started thinking about profit, but we believe in participation. And then later on, the politics, like you mentioned, Peter, will follow. Because at the end, it's about proving to the government that if a company can do that together with communities, this is probably one of the few models that they have to go forward. Um, great. Thank you, um, um, Tarsono. Now, being based in Indonesia, we kind of follow these things as well. And, and uh, I'd like to follow up with two questions here, which uh, I think you might have some insights in. One is that as we've studied the, uh, the, how the um, concessions um, operate and how the issues around uh, land use change and, and deforestation and also fires are, are evolving, we all know that some of these, or many of these communities actually live inside the concessions and under more or less agreed arrangements. So my question is, my first question is whether this is also included in, in, your, uh, in, in your approach or if you're mainly looking outside the concessions for, for these arrangements. My second question is, um, could it be seen that, that you're expanding beyond the concession for your businesses? Um, to answer your first question is, I think fortunately our concession are these, you know, we don't have any community living inside the concession, but doesn't mean that we have no obligation to do things in the community. But I think what we have also identified in terms of the participation mapping exercise that we have, there's an overlap where they are actually, you know, they don't live there, but they're doing something in that location. So in that area, we actually have even have an MOU of collaboration. I think because by, by, by de facto, in terms of the law, we are not allowed to cut the trees. And they, communities don't want to cut trees as well. So we have to identify what are the non-timber products coming out from that area. You know, and then we can actually do, a sustain, whether it's agroforestry or certain things around that area. So um, those are the things that we look into So in terms of overlap. So the good thing is our map was done prior to we get the concession. So we can actually take a look at it carefully. If there's an overlap, we will do some collaboration. Secondly, I think it's, um, the fact is, it's not about expansion. I personally think this has nothing to do with expansion. This is, this is something to do with doing the right thing for the business. Because uh, we all know that, you know, if we only look at our concession area and then just follow the rule of just taking things in our concession area, this very field area is going to be a threat to the concession. So as a project developer or as a private sector, we have to start thinking beyond the concession area. The key is how can we do this transparently? There's, you know, making sure that this is not about land grabbing and try to do something. So therefore, I think we need that political participation of the government as well. Because if you look at last year, a lot of the, you know, um, if you, I'm reading a lot of this article saying about the forest fire, a lot of the forest fire actually not coming from concession. It might be coming from peripheral. So these are the things that we have to look. So as a company uh, doing this, especially in the conservation, we really have to look at our risks as well. You know, we cannot just say that, oh, you know, uh, oh, this is, we're obligated to protect this area, then we do this alone, because we all know that the outside area can be a threat to us. But the good thing about it is, uh, the, the, the government see that as well. The government see that as well, and the government is also supporting the idea with the, with the understanding that we have to work together. Community have to work together with private sector, and, you know, private sector and community also have to work together with government. So I think, uh, just like when Paputra said, it's automatic, but I think we have to move 
to better transparency, better governance system. Therefore, the whole idea of technically what my company doing is actually to do an FMU, you know, if you, to do a forest management unit properly, to, if you have a good governance system in place. So. Great, thank you very much. I will now turn, turn to uh, Paul Tregidjo, who is uh, vice chair of Credit Suisse, based in uh, New York. And I have a feeling that we will have a focus on the middle P uh, in this uh, presentation. Paul, please. Thank you very much, Peter. And it's a pleasure to be sitting up here again today. And uh, I commend and appreciate the well-crafted follow-on from the discussion yesterday. And in answer to the question posed by our moderator, can it be a solution, PPP, whatever it stands for, the answer from my seat is a resounding yes. Why? Why is it a natural follow-on from our discussion yesterday? For those of you who were not here, here's the 30-second recap. I talked about the massive need that, that must be filled in one degree or another by the private sector capital markets of the space. I talked about the way that we get there is through measurable return, through scale, through risk-adjusted return, through liquidity, and through the ability of investors to understand what they're getting into and establishing tradable instruments, they will then participate. If those goals, those massive goals, which I acknowledge are complex, are aspirational, what we're talking about today is certainly possible. And I'd like to use this opportunity to take two examples not within the sector we're talking today, but within the PPP sector to illustrate the diversity of their application and the possibility of harnessing the complexity of these three Ps and to illustrate that the, in the recipe of success in any one given transaction, we may have a heavy P, a low P, an incipient P. And I think that's important to remember that there is no one recipe. The two, outcome, the, two, the two things that I'd like to talk about are opposite ends of the scale. One is something called social impact bonds. And in this, I think that uh, I really would commend those of you who are interested in this space to take a look at a, 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 a publication which was uh, published this uh, two weeks ago by an organization called Social Finance, called Social Impact, the early Social Impact Bonds, the early, year, the early years. From that you will see that as a result of partnerships between the private sector, between government actors focused on return for social outcomes, there is a market. It is complex, and if we take the starting point of that market as 2010, and today, that report would indicate there have been 60, 60 projects undertaken from 15 one five countries for a total of $200 million, of which 22 of those projects have reported performance data, and 12 had ma have made payments based on the outcomes that have been measured. The fields that they have covered have been criminal justice, homelessness, child welfare, and education. Now, the sector is not un uncontroversial, and the sector at the moment is not large. But the body of participation, with some successes and some failures, is proving that at the most granular level of social need, the techniques of the capital markets can be used. Now, let's go to the other end of the spectrum, and instead of talking about $200 million over five years, let's talk about $5 billion. Let's talk about scale, let's talk about aggregation. And I'm going to, for that, I'm going to move to, and it may not be necessarily defined as a PPP, but let's not get too hung up on definitions here. Let's focus on the practicalities. Some of you may be familiar with Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, which is 
a, an organization, an international organization of public and private sectors who have a shared goal, a complex goal of equal access to new and un underused vaccines for children living in the poorest countries in the world. Now, Gavi, it is known, is funded by government donors, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as a very innovative funding innovation, uh, facility we call IFIM in the trade, we call IFIM, the International Finance Facility for Immunization. Now, in very short description, what that has done is to take the commitments of nine donor countries, which incidentally include um, Australia, amongst others, who have pledged $6.5 billion to Gavi over 23 years. Fantastic, but the money is needed now. So through some of the techniques of financial engineering, which I talked about yesterday, that long-term commitment has, through the agency of IFIM, managed by the World Bank Treasury, created a financial instrument, a bond, and gone to the bond market. And in, in five, five years, has raised $5 billion in international funding from investors in the international markets. So that the long-term commitments can be turned into short-term action by accessing investors in the regular way capital markets who look for market return and a social impact. And I mean investors from all around the world. So to your question, Howard, I absolutely believe that we certainly can find solutions in the PPP world. Think about the mix, but think about the possibility. There's two very concrete examples of how we can make that success a reality. Thanks, Paul. And it's really encouraging to hear from, um, um, directly from, from, from you that the money is there. Um, and uh, if the interesting opportunity for investment is there too, then there will be a possible match. Now, the question then becomes, of course, what will make it interesting? Uh, in other words, are the uh, agendas that we are pursuing in this conference, in many other conferences, in many policies, in, in negotiations, how do we make them attractive to those investors that are outside of this space? To make these, uh, in, in, I think first of all we have to acknowledge in the PP world there is a much wider, if you will, complex or much wider range of outcomes and problems that are attacked in what I was referring to as the capital markets world. And so I think the mix can be different, but there's some commonalities to the mix. And the commonalities are the same as those that I discussed yesterday, Peter. It's the ability to demonstrate to investors that the outcomes are measurable. It is the ability to demonstrate to investors that you are transparent to disclose the risk adjusted for the return. And I believe that using, whether it's, I've used the world of local government, multilateral, and other governmental sources as helpful in the structuring of an instrument, that they can be tailored to very specific pockets of demand, small and large. But without that measurement, without that ability for a transparent look, at, look through structure, then it doesn't get off the ground. Thank you, Paul. That's a clear message. Um, finally, I would like to introduce uh, Mahmoud Yusuf, who is the CEO of the Heart of Borneo initiative, um, working out of the Ministry of Primary Resources and Tourism here in, in Brunei. Before I hand you the floor, let me also say that um, following Mahmoud's uh, presentation, and maybe I have a question for you too, 
we will immediately go into questions from the floor so that we use the maximum time available for, for questions from all of you. So please prepare your questions while, while you listen to the final presentation by Mahmoud. Please. Thank you, moderators. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, very thankful to moderators because uh, he arranged the seat very near to the potential funders for our, our forests. So, I will talk different perspective in national context. So, I will refer the successful story based on our achievements. Okay. So, as uh, everybody has uh, visited Brunei through air or through land, you have seen that the forest cover that we have still intake in pristine stage. So, this is our successful uh, uh, PPPP to answer your question there, Professor. So this is, the, this is the, the, the measure of output that we have to showcase to the international uh, uh, participants here that we have uh, still have the forest in a pristine stage. So why we have, why actually, why we achieve this, of course, three reasons. First thing I would like to, to focus here, highlight here is the importance of national leadership. National leadership led by His Majesty government, His Majesty. So, in 1990, we have produced national forest policy uh, in advance of the global agenda of climate change. In that policy, very clear, we have environmental protection. We, we have to protect forests for the sake of environment. So it's very clear we are quite aware of the global agenda of climate change. So that's very important. So how, we, how this, how, how this uh, in Brunei drive the PPPP, or I can call it multi-sectors uh, 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 basis. So because of national leadership, we have to work together to support this policy introduced by the government of His Majesty. So we have to together. Now, to my personal views, for us, it's not a single sector anymore. It's not belong to a single sector in national context. Because for us, give benefit to everybody. Everybody in, in Brunei Salam. No matter which sectors they come from, so they need for us for, for them to support national agenda of development. So, so this is very important. So for us, it's a multi-sectors, multi-sectors issue now. So we have to, to get, work together, either from agency, different agency, from the government sectors, private sectors, NGOs, we have to work together to pr protect our natural asset at this moment. So this is the biological landscape infrastructure we have to maintain. Because to me, uh, correcting environmental damage is cost, costly. Huh? We learn from other countries. So we have to protect the forest in order to protect our environment or climate change issues. So that's the second thing. Third one I would like to highlight here is national issue is not a, not only a national issue. It's become a global issue. That's why we have to work together with our neighbors, Malaysia, Indonesia, because Burya is very small. Although we are very small, but our contribution to climate change is very significant. We have 76% of land area covered by the forest. This is our bigger our big commitment to the world that we have to protect this forest, even though we are striving to support the economy, there should be other way to support the economy by, by having this forest intake. There are so many ways. Now we have a new strategy because forest no longer for logging. Forest is to protect our biodiversity. So the value of biodiversity itself is more than what we have at the moment from timber. Huh? We learn from other countries, US especially, they make use of biological resources. 
for the bio industry that cost billions of dollars. So this is our new strategy headed by our new minister. He's not here. So this is our, 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 our new strategy to promote how can forests support our, our economic growth by having these biological resources intake, by providing habitat for us, ha ha for us as habitat and also marine as habitat of biological resources that we have at the moment. That this is the future industrial asset for our Brunei Rusala to, to support our national economic growth. So that's very important. So I think that, that's a very brief that I would like to like at this stage. And I, would, I want to hear from the floor. So. Great, thank you, Mahmoud. Before that, I have a very short question for you. And I really like your perspective that the forest really contributes to all the sectors. And I think that's a perspective we share, and very much from, from, from CIFR we share that perspective too. Um, and that the value proposition from the forest is evolving all the time, that we see new values, new, new uh, revenues, in, in fact, that, that can be derived from the forest. This is important too. So my question, and you don't have to answer it, but it's a question. How big part of that overall revenue is the carbon? How big, how, how, what is the proportion of that overall revenue that is represented by carbon, carbon storage, I should say? Well, this is a new, uh, a new business strategy that we have to uh, explore in the future. Because as, as I mentioned by one minister yesterday in the keynote speech, uh, keynote speech, this is something that we have to explore in the future. Because carbon, that we are very confident that our forest content more than what we have in terms of hydrocarbon, yeah? So the carbon that we have, we, we work with FAO, FRA. So the, 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 the most update, uh, data that we get from FRA is our forest contain 120 uh, carbon biomass per hectare. So this is very uh, significant, substantive amount of carbon that we can trade with other countries. So this is one of the economic uh, benefit that we have to conserve our forest, protect our forest for the sake of future. Without destroying our forest, we can also we, we can also benefit from other industry. Great, thank you very much. I'd like now to turn to the floor and uh, see if we have any questions. Please step up to the microphones and and introduce yourselves. Who would like to start? Please. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you for all panelists. Uh, first question I would like to pose to the wildlife birds. You mentioned that your contribution is, is the focusing on the community based on and also the the concession that the, the land belong to the government. And they, I wonder whether you have any other aspect for the country who do not have any concession and the government own how you decide to contribute for your, for your the, uh, investment. And for example, for reforestation, whether you plan for that and how is the, your benefit sharing plan because your stakeholder is diverse, how to come up to the point that the, all stakeholders agree on your benefit sharing. And the second question to the gentleman from the, I think, the credit sources is the, you said it's very good future for the partnership government and private, but they, as we look at the whole picture of the contribution of Red Plus today, there's greenhouse gas 20% emission comparing to the global uh, emission of the world, and they, uh, how to come the optimum partnership with the government and private to invest because all country have their own target to reduce the emission that if we ex that 20 percent contribution from the red plus how how do you decide to fill the gap 
and they, at the pop proportion of the good, not only overweight by private sector investment, and so that to will ensure the environmental integrity will captures, and the yeah, and would like to see because the in private sector is very complex, but how privacy expect that how you involve on on that, and also during negotiation, also the whole picture that they the pressure that would like each country have their own domestic uh, greenhouse gas emission, but when we involve the private sector, how to come up with the optimum contribution that we can uh, come to the point that we could see the global image, a greenhouse gas 20% reduction. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'll let you think for a minute on that and see if we have some more questions uh, in this first round. We have, yes please, and then uh, we have another one in the back. So let's take those questions as well. Hi, good morning. My name is Kamaria. I'm from Brunei. I'm the owner of Kunit 7 Lodge from Kambongair, the water village. I have a question to Tuan Muhammad Yusuf. One of the questions is, um, Kambongair is actually built on basically wood or timber. So how much of the wood or timber is actually towards uh, the water village people? And how can we educate the water village people how to cut down on recycle, uh, upscale, upcycle of all this wood? And are there a anything special that we can do with the water village in terms of wood? Um, could be in the sense of awareness. My second question would be to Brian. Brian, I love the idea of how you actually build a community in the forest. Unfortunately, I'm in the water. How can I bring the idea what you have in the forest into the water village, considering that we still are using wood? Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I had, we had one more question from the back, and then we'll turn to the panel again. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hasbi from uh, the Partnership Indonesia. I have two points. Uh, the first one is we have uh, limited in numbers of the champions in developing the public-private partnership or community uh, company partnership. Uh, like, uh, for example, in Indonesia, we have a limited numbers like what explains by Rimba Makmur Utama or some initiative uh, developed by APP, but we have a limited number. So it is very important that the government as uh, the policy maker and uh, the private sector who have uh, concessions to work more intensive, uh, like for the government to make uh, like uh, evaluations uh, and also to uh, distribute the lessons and best practices in developing the, these partnerships. Uh, it is very important that uh, cooperation between the government and concessions uh, will impact to, to develop the, these schemes. The second uh, suggestion uh, that in our experience, the rules and the benefits for the local community uh, is very important in developing the public-private partnership. In some cases, we found that when the, uh, the government and the private sector uh, have uh, cooperations, and then the local community only get very uh, not significant impacts. They only uh, participate or engage as the labor and no schemes for their benefit as the community. So it is very important to put the local community as the party, one important party in developing the public-private partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will, uh, from this, we will have to have comments from the whole panel. Uh, but I suggest, Brian, that you start. You had two questions uh, directed to you. Um, 
Yeah, th thank you for those uh, questions. Um, in terms of uh, reforestation, uh, we do do reforestation within our project sites, uh, but we do not try to get credit for those reforestation. So uh, we don't do reforestation-centered projects. We focus on reducing emissions from deforestation. So to answer that question is, um, we do reforestation of uh, degraded areas within the project sites. Um, that is one way that we work with reforestation. However, we don't do uh, just reforestation projects. In terms of benefit sharing, um, we develop the benefit sharing with the communities and with all the partners involved in a project. So if the, if the um, stakeholder is a government entity, um, then we work with the government to decide what is fair. And we try to bring all of the um, stakeholders to the table at first before we ever start the project and, and invest a dollar, we determine exactly how the benefits will be shared um, and uh, outline that first. So that's how we develop a inclusive benefit sharing plan and we do not move forward until we have that in place. So we do that first. Um, I think there was one other, yeah, the other question about the water village. Um, I think it, it depends, I, I don't know the water village, I'm sorry, I don't know the specifics. You can do, uh, there is now a methodology for, uh, through, through VCS, to produce carbon credits in um, mangroves um, and wetlands. So you could bring this concept that, that we've developed, um, the Red Plus concept, to a, a coastal area or along a river, um, a riparian area would be another area that you could do it in as well. Um, and it, you know, the, a project is a project. So as long as you have a way to um, pay for the operations, in this case, we're using the carbon finance by the, the sale of carbon credit. So that would be a, a way you could bring that to the water village. Great, thank you. There was a question for you, Paul, on the uh, global emissions. I love that question. Thank you very much. And you'll forgive me if I give somewhat of what might seem as a philosophical answer, but I do think this is of practical importance. You asked essentially about the role of the market in deciding choices. Well, I think that we all, I, I try what I do day to day, I believe in the power of the markets for good, but the markets are not elected representatives of the people or communities. The markets, to some extent, can drive the consequences of policy, can influence policy, can inform policy. But in the context of private-public partnerships, I do believe it's the market's jobs to inform of possibilities of outcome, to inform of potential pros and cons of the way in which policies are made. But at the level you're talking about, I do believe that the responsibilities of certain actors are more directly aligned with deciding the basis than the markets driving the conclusions of the elected representatives of the communities. I do think, and I certainly don't absolve the markets or markets participants from entering into the debate, for standing up and be counted about assessing possibilities and assessing practical outcomes in the markets of certain decisions, but at, the, at its fundamental root, the responsibility for allocation of global goods remains with the global democracies. Thank you, Paul. Um, we'll turn to Mahmoud. You had a question related to uh, wood, I believe. Okay, thank you for the question. So, <clears throat> I'm very proud the question come from Brunei. So, I love the question also, like yourself. Okay, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, forest is belong to everybody in Brunei Salam. It's a multi-stakeholders benefit. So once the benefits go to everybody, so it's our responsibility to work together to protect our forests. So one of the benefits of having this forest, of course, the, the community itself from Water Village, because Brunei is established by having Water Village. The, the east of the Venice, Venice of the east, sorry. So we have to protect the culture. We have to protect the tradition of the people living in, near the forest. We have the provisions in our law. 
under fifth, section 52, rules 19 and above. There is a provision to protect the native right to take forest produce. So perhaps this is the, this is the, 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 the honor that we give to all people living in the forest that they have the right to practice their the tradition, the culture by having the forest. So they, they have the right to take the forest produce, but on, on domestic basis, not commercial. So that's very important. So on the recycle, I think uh, I'm not expert in recycle. Of course, I'm trying to uh, promote uh, substitution of uh, woods. Uh, now we have so many uh, steel uh, for uh, wood truss. So this is a very good improvement to substitute use of wood uh, to reduce the pressure on the wood uh, uh, to source our wood timber from the, our forest itself. So this, is, to me, is a good, uh, a good uh, development that we have to substitute certain component of the wood in the uh, construction to have a, a steel or whatever. So this is a very good uh, development that really supporting our conservation protection of the forest resources. So we don't rely 100% to the forest for the sake of infrastructure or whatever. So, so if you want, if the, three, uh, the, the native people want to apply, use the net forest product, they have to apply. They have to apply to the uh, certain agencies in our, our, our Ministry of uh, Primary Resources in Tourism. So we have, they have the right, but we have to monitor by giving them license. So that's a simple, simple answer for you. Is that, is that really answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate uh, the use of wood in this building. So I, I really hope that we can find ways to combine both the use of wood and the protection of forests. That will be the best of all solutions, I think. Um, there, will, there were a couple of comments and questions related more to the government and, and concessions. I don't know if Pak Butra or Pak Darsona would like to comment on that. Well, probably the question relates to me is the encouragement from HASBI on the importance of uh, intensifying our uh, PP uh, partnership and also to make sure not to let the, the most important P, actually, the people, uh, to, uh, to be less significant. I think we are, the government, uh, really uh, working on that. And actually, by regulation, we require companies uh, to uh, to promote cooperation with the people and ex actually we uh, ask companies to provide 20 percent of their land for the access uh, for the cooperation with the people and it, it's by regulation uh, it's required like that so that's to make sure that uh, the, the, uh, the people will be the subject of the uh, cooperation, the partnership, not just uh, uh, the object. And all in all, we plan to have 12.7 million hectares of forest land will be allocated for the access of the people uh, under this, uh, uh, our new current government. And uh, in the field, uh, there are already some example taking place, uh, like in Lampung, where uh, tenurial conflict is very uh, uh, difficult to solve, and we we can we was uh, we were able to uh, facilitate uh, cooperation between company and uh, the people, win-win um, uh, partnership, in which the people will utilize the uh, land uh, which is licensed to the company, but then the company will uh, will buy the product from the from the land, so it's a good cooperation. Also, in terms of producing energy in East Nusa Tenggara, we are approaching a, an output we are expecting from that. And also, of course, in Kalimantan, there is a, a industrial timber company also having a good partnership with the local people, in which the local people becoming like the the plus the plasm of the. Uh, uh, company, so uh, we are working uh, really to have this PPP uh, to work in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Pak. Um, 
Dr. Sony, you want to comment on that? I just want to add basically the point that has been made. I think the key is, um, you know, if um, we're talking about benefit sharing, uh, all these issues, like I mentioned about putting the community forestry in our, you know, buffer, I think when you have a good governance as well as transparency, so you can actually see, for example, what we envision is this um, buffer area, if assuming that the carbon market eventually come and all this revenue are coming, we will be happy to actually promote and help the communities to be a community-based carbon credit project. And then they can sell credit, so they will entitle to the credits, they will have all the benefit that, that comes with it. So I think um, it's, um, all this issue of benefit sharing can be resolved if you have a good governance and a transparency from all parties. So you have government side, private sector, as well as community. But I also want to, I always remind the communities that this is, there has to be accountability. This is, I mean, in order for us to save and conserve forests, you know, all parties have to be involved. But, you know, we have to make sure that there's accountability. And in the meantime, we also are providing solution. The key is to providing solution to communities as an alternative livelihood if they want, they're cutting the trees or burn, doing slash and burn. So I think I'm, I'm very excited, uh, you know, that the current government are really very open-minded. Like, for example, Paputra and his staff, We've been working together in terms of designing something that we, with a collaboration as a community, as part of the center piece of uh, uh, the puzzle that we need to solve. So. Great, thanks. Um, we have, if there is a burning question from, from the audience, I think we can take one more before we wrap up. Um, did I see a hand? Yes, far away from the mic. Oh, there's a microphone over there. Please go ahead, the last question for this session. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Go from uh, Ministry of Environment and, and Forestry. So I, actually, I'm uh, under pa, pa Putra. My, my question is... Can, 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 can you please speak a bit closer to the microphone? Okay. Uh, my, my, my comment is that when we talk about the community, as if uh, they are uh, all, uh, all weak people, and good people. In, in, in fact, in, the, in reality, there are all kinds of, of community uh, elements there. There are uh, people who, who, have, who have power, who are power, powerful people uh, out there. And, and I think in this discussion, we need to also uh, take them into account of how to to deal with, 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 with that uh, issue. So I wonder how it works in, in, in Africa as well as in, in, in Asia, uh, dealing with all sorts of, 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 of community. Because I, I imagine the, the benefit sharing is not, uh, it's not very easy when uh, I understand in, in Africa with the, with the uh, the the trade uh, the illegal trade of 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 wildlife uh, wildlife uh, products for example also a similar case in 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 Asia I think we we need to to uh, take that uh, into account thank you thank you any comments on 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 this uh, so thank you for, thank you for the thank you for that comment and. Uh, that brings us to, to the closure of, of uh, this session. Let me just say one word before I thank the, the panel. Um, I think it's interesting, and I, I don't want to end with a totally conciliatory comment here. I think we should keep some of the tensions that we all experience and, and work on them. And I, I find it intriguing that we have representatives of HP here. We have two representatives of, of governments, which is obviously the politics. We have uh, Brian, who I would say represents mainly the participation, coming from the participation end at least. And we have two representatives that would be the middle P, the profit-making piece. Uh, but what I find intriguing is that although you, you come from these ends, all of you see the need and, and, and the uh, uh, requirements to emphasize the other two P's. And that's, that's what I think we should take from this discussion, that although we have specific interests on the panel, they've all emphasized the other interests and, and the need for and the dependencies between between these uh, parameters. We haven't solved this yet, and there are 
that's another thing to take from, from this panel, that there's a diversity of solutions. There are no silver bullets. Um, these are complex issues, and, and uh, we need to embrace that complexity and allow for diversity to be there. Um, by that, I would like to thank the panel for this session and uh, hope that we're almost on time, Howard. So let's give a hand to the panel. <laughs>